Abigail Plummer holds degrees from Antioch College, Columbia University, and Cornell University. In addition, she has studied at Vanderbilt University and the University of Ibodan in Nigeria. Professor Plummer began her teaching career in 1973 and joined the faculty of the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1991. She holds a joint appointment in the departments of Afro-American Studies and History. Professor Plummer is the author of two books on Haitian-American relations and one on African-Americans in U.S. foreign affairs. She edited the anthology Window on Freedom, Race, Civil Rights, and Foreign Affairs and served on the U.S. Department of State Historical Advisory Committee. Today, she plans to highlight the connections between the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement in the U.S. Please join me in welcoming Professor Brenda, Brenda Gail Plummer. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, you may be wondering what the uh, Cold War has to do with the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> uh, it might seem like a strange juxtaposition. Uh, one of the things I've always been interested in as a historian is those strange juxtapositions. Um, and there are many. I think uh, uh, the way that we usually learn history, and you know, I learned it the same way, um, was basically that um, you know, there was a, a age of exploration. There was a renaissance. There was a early American period, so on and so forth. We tend to put those kinds of labels on things. But one of the things that we forget is that some of these labels, in fact, overlap. Um, we talk, for example, about the age of exploration, and we forget that that's really um, the same span of generations as the Renaissance. But we tend to compartmentalize. Uh, what I'd like to do is to, uh, to break up that compartmentalization um, and to talk about uh, ways in which the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement are related, and specifically how the Cold War both helped and hurt the civil rights movement. The slide that um, is being projected right now is a wartime poster. Um, the uh, pilot that you see is uh, one of the famous Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, the poster really represents, I think, um, the way in which African Americans supported the U.S. Uh, effort in World War II and talked about a double victory, victory over fascism abroad and racism at home. Uh, African Americans were major war bonds purchasers, and there was a sense in which after the war was over that some accounts were to be held. The changes caused by the war affected race relations uh, in very profound ways. Uh, things would not be the same. After the German death camps, it became increasingly difficult uh, to defend racism. Uh, the war played a major role uh, in defeating uh, the logic of racial discrimination. Uh, ironically, Nazi uh, racial theorists had studied the writings and legal practices of U.S. segregationists and eugenicists. So uh, uh, it became uh, somewhat uh, problematic to have a situation in which black GIs were denied admission to restaurants uh, at which German POWs were feasting. These kinds of contradictions then meant that things would have to change. Things would have to change. Well, um, not everybody agreed initially that things had to change. Let's take a look. OK, um, during the uh, early Cold War, and my remarks today are really about the period from the end of the war to about 1958, um, there was not unanimity in the United States about what should be the role of African Americans in American life. Those people who advocated change suggested that the United States needed racial reform in order to assume global leadership. Remember that the war um, had left a little bit of a power vacuum. Who was going to fill it? Uh, would it be 
the Soviet Union and its Warsaw, what would later become its Warsaw uh, Pact allies? Or would it be the United States representing liberal democracies in Western Europe? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, some people argued that if the United States was to assume the global leadership that it deserved, it needed to do some house cleaning. Not everybody agreed. Full civil rights for African Americans would cause some problems. Right? It would change things. It would destabilize relationships among the races. Uh, it would change particularly society in the South. Uh, was the United States ready for this? Uh, wouldn't this uh, you know, rapid change in itself create problems for national security? Well, uh, some people would argue that inequality itself was the cause of civil unrest, subversion, and disloyalty. Others would argue that equality itself was, uh, it was an invitation to subversion, insecurity, and disloyalty. Some made the argument that human capital was wasted by practices of Jim Crow discrimination. Uh, by not educating people, you were forfeiting the contributions that those people might make to society. Okay? Uh, by keeping people poor, you were uh, preventing them from spending money, generating uh, uh, wealth that would benefit the society as a whole. Others argued that it was necessary to maintain uh, hierarchies uh, in order uh, to keep the economic system going, and particularly in the South which even though it was experiencing some changes as a result of the war, was still uh, in the late 40s and early 50s rather dependent on a cheapened, docile labor force. Well, as it turns out, in this particular debate, the pros won. The pros won. Uh, and the uh, momentum for change on the racial front came to the fore. Part of the reason it came to the fore was the Cold War itself. Uh, this particular illustration is of the way that a bipolar world um, had come about um, after the war. With, uh, on the uh, left, uh, the blue uh, areas representing the United States and its Western European allies. Um, on the right, the Soviet Union and its allies. So the Cold War was defined as a struggle between not only two economic systems, but two political systems, two ways of life. Now what about all those, those places that are gray on there? Well, um, those were the, the, the peoples uh, whose loyalties were being pursued. Uh, would they side with the West? Uh, would they side with uh, the Soviet bloc? Would they become communist? Would they remain uh, non-aligned? It was up in the air, yeah. up in the air. Uh, this strengthened the argument that for the United States to maintain its role and to expand its leadership of democratic powers, uh, that it needed to do something about racism. Now here's a, a picture of President Harry Truman and uh, in this image, he appears with, um, uh, right next to him, Mary McLeod Bethune, president of the National Council of Negro Women, uh, Indian Ambassador Vijaya Pandit, and UN mediator Ralph Bunch. Now, um, the, the, the international um, uh, aspect of this uh, photograph, I think, is, uh, is, is rather important. India was a major critic of the United States uh, with regard to its race relations. India was also a very large non-aligned power that the United States had hoped to wean away from its friendship with the USSR. Ralph Bunch uh, represents uh, the United Nations and the uh, wide array of opinion uh, in that organization, uh, which as time went on became larger and larger. Uh, had a membership which increasingly represented the 
peoples of uh, the global south whose opinions were um, important uh, to the United States uh, on this matter. It, it, it's sort of a, you know, interesting. You know, I uh, you know, talk to my students about the Cold War. And um, you know, it just shows you know, how, you know, how advanced we're getting here. These are kids who, if they're 21, they were born in 1989. <laughs> I mean, there is no memory whatsoever, right? What are you talking about? You know, how could this you know, be happening? Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, you know, uh, we put on our, our memory caps and we can think about um, just how bipolar the world was during that era, right? Um, you, know, there were, you know, there was not a lot of room for, for the gray that you see, right? There was a lot of pressure on those countries uh, in gray to align themselves one way or the other. Yeah, one of the major groups in society that was interested in change among the people in the pro column um, was uh, the, the larger corporations and businesses. This particular individual was president of General Electric. Um, and uh, Wilson and other uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, similar persons realized very early on that lynching and uh, riots and pogroms and so on were really not compatible <laughs> with an advanced industrial society. Right? Uh, I mean, you can't you know, uh, leave work and go off to the town square and hang somebody. Right? <laughs> You know, it does tend to disrupt the flow of production. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, even you know, back toward the turn of the century, Atlanta, uh, of all places, had a adopted a slogan. Um, it called itself the city too busy to hate. The city too busy to hate. Wilson was appointed to President Truman's Committee on Civil Rights. And uh, let me just quote you, a, a, a paragraph from the report that committee issued in 1947. Right? Uh, it included this observation. Quote, our position in the post-war world is so vital to the future that our smallest actions have far-reaching effects. We have come to know that our own security in a highly interdependent world is inextricably tied to the security and well-being of all people in all countries. Our foreign policy is designed to make the United States an enormous positive influence for peace and progress throughout the world. We have tried to let nothing, not even extreme political differences between ourselves and foreign nations, stand in the way of this goal. But our domestic civil rights shortcomings are a serious obstacle, end quote. Now, as, a, as colonialism declined as a system of uh, economic and political management, more countries became independent and joined the United Nations. And in 1960, some 17 new states appeared, um, and the U.S. vulnerabilities on uh, the question of race were often attacked in the General Assembly. And the critics were not limited to the communist countries. Uh, envoys from developing countries also frequently ex uh, expressed outrage at reports of racial violence that were being reported in the world press. Everybody was weighing in on this. Everybody was hearing about um, Birmingham, Montgomery, Jackson, so on and so forth. However, not everyone was sold on the importance of international activism and cooperation. Uh, one skeptic was a Senator John W. Bricker of Ohio. Um, he had qualms about the new role the US was assuming, especially the possibility that international obligations uh, would undercut the United States' sovereign powers. So uh, Senator Bricker uh, uh, proposed the famous Bricker Amendment uh, which was uh, debated in Congress in 1953 and 1954, um, that was aimed at uh, limiting the power of the executive to make treaties. Now, interestingly, uh, the Bricker Amendment uh, was popular with segregationists. 
Why? Uh, because they were concerned about the application of international standards to such things as education. Um, if the United States was required to abide by international standards, you could not have racial segregation in the, in the public schools, for example. If the United States was required to abide by international standards, it would face scrutiny over such things as uh, allowing people to vote. Um, so for that reason, then, um, we might place then uh, those people who were opposing international engagement in the camp of Cold War pressures on the hurt side of the civil rights movement. All right, we're talking about what helped the civil rights movement, what hurt the civil rights movement. Uh, what we find is that the Bricker uh, Amendment uh, and uh, those people opposing uh, the United States being internationally activists uh, tended to have a negative effect on civil rights activism and civil rights enforcement. On the plus side, uh, one of the... Uh, events or uh, phenomena that occurred uh, during the New Deal and during World War II uh, was the rise of trade unionism. Uh, unions, especially those that uh, had been affiliated with the uh, CIO, uh, supported civil rights for all Americans uh, during the New Deal and World War II periods. Now, during the uh, Red Scare, which most broadly can be seen as extending from about 1946 to 1953, uh, communists and others who were deemed radical were purged from these organizations. Um, radicals, however, had been among the most fervent allies and supporters of civil rights. Uh, were there communists in the, in the labor movement? Definitely. Were there communists in the civil rights movement? Definitely. Look at the context, right? We're talking about a time in which um, civil rights for blacks itself was considered radical by a lot of people. Uh, the loss of the support of radicals through these purges then is something else that we might put on the hurt side. Okay, um, interesting companion to the Red Scare uh, was something that historians have called the um, uh, Lavender Scare um, that ac accompanied the Red Scare and had a similar reason for being. Um, the, the, the idea being to remove uh, gay people from sensitive security jobs because it was felt that they could be readily blackmailed. Uh, and again, you know, in the, in, the, in the social context of this period, right, uh, this was... Um, you know, a major uh, issue. It's a major issue. Now, homophobia hurt the civil rights movement by hampering the work of such able organizers as Bayard Rustin, um, who had to take a very low profile um, in his organizing and in his uh, assistance uh, to Martin Luther King uh, because of his reputation um, as a gay man. The United States developed some very interesting ways of fighting the Cold War and um, some very compelling ones. Um, the slide that you're looking at now is of uh, a trade fair that took place in Moscow that Vice President Nixon came to to represent the United States. And uh, what Nixon uh, told Khrushchev, who he's talking to here, is is that the, the American way of life was superior because of the, the affluence and ease that it offered American consumers. He didn't uh, premise his, um, uh, his claim on ideological supremacy. Instead, he premised it on the good life, uh, that Americans did not have to suffer through the drab lives that people in the, behind the Iron Curtain suffered through that they could own things, that they could have things, that they could enjoy life. This also extended to African Americans. One of the arguments that State Department, USIA made, is that uh, blacks in the United States were probably the most affluent 
people, black people in the world. And they you know, had you know, good grounds for saying that in terms of you know, sheer material things. Uh, and so in the essentially propaganda that the United States sent abroad, uh, one of the features of this was to talk about how well African Americans were doing, um, how much better they were doing than they'd done in the past. Um, copies of, of, of Ebony and Jet, which were magazines which also echoed this message, were sent to USIA libraries abroad and so on and so forth. So uh, th this uh, uh, you know, was an important weapon um, in the Cold War. But it, what it also meant was that if you were going to talk the talk, you had to walk the walk. And so if you're going to make those kinds of claims, then it would have, would have to be necessary for African Americans to, in fact, uh, arrive at that place that the government was saying it had already arrived at. So this is definitely on the on the, the help side. Okay, big shock. <laughs> um, 1957, Sputnik. Right. This is a, a Russian stamp that commemorates that, uh, the, the Russian uh, launch of their satellite, uh, which came as a big shock to the United States and uh, caused a great deal of uh, soul-searching and hand-wringing about why the United States had not become the first in space. And so there were all kinds of critiques about you know, the, the deficiencies in science, deficiencies in mathematics education, and a race to catch up. OK, well, how would the United States catch up? 1958, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act. It was a clear response to Sputnik. Uh, it provided money for science, mathematics, engineering education. Uh, provided money for area studies. And it helped to change the way that Americans were thinking about college education. Um, college education had widely been perceived as a luxury. Now it was being touted as serving national interests. So uh, enhanced federal support aided historically black colleges and universities, brought into higher education many of those young people who uh, were in the first sit-ins. Policymakers came to see it, an educated populace as the best guarantee of national security. That's an editorial from me, by the way, too. <laughs> the uh, Brussels World's Fair of 1958, same year that the NDA was passed, provided an opportunity for the United States to uh, strut its stuff in general. So a year after Little Rock, the organizers, U.S. organizers of the, of the U.S. pavilion at the fair made a point of uh, diversifying the staff of pavilion guides, as illustrated by this uh, cover photo from Jet Magazine. Uh, what's noteworthy here, I think, is uh, the effort made to uh, put a positive spin on race relations um, uh, at the fair by demonstrating that Americans represented a wide range of different ethnic and racial types, a concern which had not bothered people in decades past, uh, but which was now being perceived as, as a priority. So um, if, uh, in, in, in summarizing this uh, vignette on, on the relationship between the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement, um, I think we can uh, see that there were some factors that both uh, helped the Civil Rights Movement and hurt the movement um, as uh, the uh, period of the early Cold War continued. Foreign support for civil rights insurgency was a, definitely a help, but it did not hurt it, but it did not help the civil rights movement when um, Americans rejected that criticism um, and uh, sort of circled the wagons uh, and went back to that older uh, argument uh, that was uh, being made in the earlier part of the period. Uh, what helped the civil rights movement was support from people who were discredited by the mainstream, communists, Bohemians, gay people, 
uh, misfits, if you will, of various kinds, right, who happen to be among the oldest and most fervent activists on, uh, on this issue. Suppression of such persons um, tended to delay things. One of the questions that you know, people uh, uh, often wonder about is, since World War II was such a, a, a momentous event, uh, discredited racism, uh, provoked so much energy on the part of African Americans, uh, uh, promised so much uh, in the way of democratic possibilities, why is it that the civil rights movement, as, as conventionally understood, didn't start until 10 years later? Why wasn't there a Montgomery bus boycott in 1945 instead of 1955? Well, part of the reason has to do with the resistance, right? uh, resistance um, to change caused by the conflation of civil rights uh, with um, radicalism. Now, what does happen is very interesting. The establishment, broadly speaking, cultural figures, policy makers, business leaders, and so on and so forth, come to embrace civil rights. But they embrace it when and if it can be decoupled from the radicalism with which it was previously associated. For the civil rights movement, it meant that certain allies had to be repudiated. Um, and some people have suggested that um, the reason why so many of uh, the uh, civil rights leaders of the late 50s and early 60s were ministers, members of the clergy, right, and not labor leaders, was because of the discrediting of those early radicals. So uh, basically, there you have it. Um, how the civil rights, how the Cold War both helped and hurt the civil rights movement. So thank you very much for listening.